So I was standing in our living room, kind of kitchen area yesterday. And I looked over at Desiree and I gave her a particular directive. Uh, to my directive, uh, Desiree had made a specific response. And because I love my daughter, you won't know the details of that. She gave a specific response uh, to my directive. She responded to me, Danny and Katie, Teresa, and I responded in return um, with, a, with a tinge of a parental kind of a tone. Desiree felt disturbed by our exchange, not to say the least. She was, she was disturbed by a portion of it. But I love what she did next. Instead of like retreating to her room and refusing to talk to me, shutting down on me, asking if she can just have a moment, she didn't really want to talk about anything, she decided to instead engage me further in conversation. She decided to put her issue, what disturbed her, on the table. Yes, sir. And I appreciated that. And long story short, Ransom, we ended up talking through the issue, and we were able to settle it, and then we continued on with our day. All families have issues. All of them, including God's family. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. What distinguishes families from one another as it relates to issues is how they deal with those issues when they arise. Notice I said when, not if. Imperfect, unhealthy families run from problems. Imperfect, healthy families seek to face them head on and confront one another as needed. Both healthy and unhealthy families are imperfect. Please don't miss it. But what distinguishes an imperfect, unhealthy family from an imperfect, healthy family is that the imperfect, healthy family hits issues head on and seeks to address it and to confront one another. And when and if they fail to confront one another, they are upfront about how they fail to confront one another. And just so we are on the same page, when I say confrontation, because I saw some of y'all twinge, I don't mean being argumentative, mean-spirited, petty, or sinfully angry with one another when dealing with issues. I'm using the word confront in the basic sense of addressing an issue or problem. We're called to confront one another. There are two types of issues that eventually surface in the life of the church that will require us to confront one another. There's the issue of when unrepentant sin is committed and when relational conflict is involved. As a family of God, as brothers and sisters in Christ, our Heavenly Father has given us commands on how he desires for us to handle these two issues. When unrepentant sin is committed, and when relational conflict is involved. Before we delve into the prescription for confrontation, I think it will be beneficial for us to briefly deal with the posture of confrontation, the posture of confrontation. Before we confront one another regarding sin and conflict, or sin or conflict, we should make sure that we assume the following heart postures. Here's the first one. It is the posture of prayer. We should pray for God before we confront one another to soften the heart of our fellow brother or sister in Christ whom we are going to confront. Yes, sir. We also should pray 
that God will grant us, the one who is doing the confronting, grace, wisdom, and courage yes. to have that difficult conversation. Yes. Amen. Amen. Because if we're honest, none of us like conflict. I mean, I mean, some of us may do, and you just a rarity. You, you just rare. But, but for, for most of us, we don't like conflict. And for some of us, we would rather just dismiss it and, not just, and just disregard it. But it doesn't help. And it's not following the prescription that God is going to give us. And so we need to be praying for God to help us to have the courage, to have the grace, and have the wisdom to have a difficult conversation. Here's the next posture, is the posture of humility. Before we seek to confront one another regarding whatever the issue is, we need to put to death our self-righteous pride. What I mean by that is that we may not have ever sinned against that brother or, f- or fellow brother or sister in the Lord who has sinned against us. Or we may not ever have had a problem with that fellow brother or sister in Christ who has a problem with us. That may be true. But I would venture to say that all of us in this room at some point have either sinned against a fellow believer or have had a problem with a fellow believer in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. You don't have to admit it. But if you've been walking with the Lord and walking with the church long enough, you, you, you and I have either sinned against another believer or we have had a problem with another believer. And so we don't need to have a, an I am better than you type of heart posture. When we're confronting one another, we don't need to have, I am glad I'm not like you kind of heart posture, because the truth is we are like one another in this regard. Yes, sir. Yes. We may not have sinned against them in the same fashion. We may not have sinned against that particular believer in that way. We may not have, have ever had a problem with that particular believer who has a problem with us or who has sinned against us. But we have sinned and have had a problem with some believer along the way. Do y'all follow what I'm saying here? So we can't say I have never sinned against another believer. Or we can never say I have never had a problem with another believer. And if, if, if you haven't, just keep living. Just keep hanging around the church. Just keep getting in. Now, listen, you, you can possibly do this. If you're not really invested in the life of a church, the only way that you can not get into these kind of murky situations with another believer is if you keep yourself on the fringes. That if you if you if you come in and you want to just be anonymous, where you just hop in churches or you never join a church, then then you can possibly say that you can probably say that. Well, I've never was because you've never really been engaged in the life of a church because everybody sitting here can attest. And if I said, raise your hand, you ain't got to do it. Raise your hand. If you've been actively engaged in the life of the church and you've ran into one of those two problems, you either sinned against a believer or somebody sinned against you, or you've had a problem with the believer or a believer has had a problem with you. Every hand in here will go up. Hmm? It's just a part of what it means to be, in the family of God. And so we need to have a posture of humility. And and though I may, and and, and hear this, though you may not have to assume this next posture in every case of confrontation, it is one that you need to be aware of, and it is the posture of consultation. Proverbs 11, verse 14 says, where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. Seeking out godly, godly, Mm -hmm. biblically informed counsel of mature believers can help us to know how to navigate through some of the choppy relational waters that we may be in. 
Sometimes you need another person who can, who act, who can be more objective yes, sir. and who's not engaged in it, who can help you know when you need to do something or how you need to do something or whether you need to do something at all yes, sir. in relationship to confronting one another. All right, so, so now that we've touched on that, let's turn our attention to the prescription for confrontation. The prescription for confrontation. God has prescribed, he's given us instructions on how we need to confront one another. And hear me, family, we may not like what we are about to hear. We may prefer to do things our way when it comes to confronting one another. We may not want to engage in confrontation at all because it doesn't feel comfortable to us or because we may be fearful of how the other person may respond. I get all of that. I truly do. And I understand and I struggle with those same thoughts and feelings as well. But God's way is always the best way. And whether we like it or not, if we want to experience the type of community that God desires for us to experience, we need to do things his way. So we need to follow his instructions, even when it is hard, scary and uncomfortable. So what are we to do when there is unrepentant sin committed between us? When there is uncommitted or committed rather unrepentant sin committed between us. Uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I don't have any slides on this point for a reason. It's because I want you to actually look at the passage in the Bible for yourself. Matthew chapter 18. I want you to begin following me at verse 15. Reading from the English Standard Version, you'll be able to follow along regardless of what version you have, if it's different than this. If your brother, and you can put in their sister, it's a general term, if your brother sins against you, stop. The first thing we need to be clear on is what classifies being sinned against. To sin against one another is to fail to do what God commands us to do in relationship to each other. For a brother or sister Christ to sin against you is to fail to do whatever God has commanded that brother or sister to do in relationship to you. I'm, I'm pressing this point because you and I don't get to define what sin is. God has already defined yes. what sin is. Yes, sir. So, for example, lying to one another is a sin. Yes. Gossiping about one another is a sin. Using abusive language towards one another is a sin. Not being submissive to one another is a sin. Being sinfully angry towards one another is a sin. Being domineering over one another is a sin. Not forgiving one another is a sin. You get the point. We got to look to God's word to yes. determine if somebody has sinned against yes. us. Yes. Not because they didn't do something that you prefer or don't prefer or something that, you know, doesn't, you know, line or align with your desires. No, no, this ain't what we're talking about. The Bible says, you read it, if your brother or sister sins against you, if they lie about you, if they lie on you, if they gossip about you, if they do whatever. There's a ton of things in the Bible that, that if we don't do them or if we do them, it's sinning against one another. So, so if you're saying, well, how do I know? Well, take what you, that person has done to you and go, looking, and go look at the Bible and see if the Bible speaks to that. Yes. Yes. If you don't know, then go ask somebody who may know the Bible better than you. Right? Who may be, may be more knowledgeable than you. Or ask the question, hey, is this a sin? And find out what the Bible says. If you don't find it in the Bible, it's not a sin. Yes. Yes. Good, bro. Well, well, he or she bumped 
like into me on the way out of church. Were they malicious when they did it? No, no, I think they tripped on something and then they just bumped into me, but I felt some type of way. That ain't a sin. They didn't sin against you. They just accidentally bumped into you. You get the point, right? If a brother or sister sins against you, there is a three-step process we are to employ in such cases. I'm in the Bible. I want you to see it. Verse 15, if your brother sins against you, step one, go and tell him or her his fault between you and him alone. Yes. Privately. Y'all hear, are, you, are you looking at the Bible with me? Yes. Go to your brother or sister and tell him or her his fault in private. Alone. Tell him his fault between you and him alone. Is that in there? Tell him his, tell him his fault between you and him alone. Is that in there? You see it? Let me one more time. Tell him his fault between you and him alone. Go in private. I know how we do, though. I know. I know how we do. We, we tend to talk to somebody else about it, you know, and tell them such and such did something to me, whatever. And listen, I get it. I'm not, we're not being nitpicky. But, but at some point, listen, you, one, you shouldn't be doing that as a means to slander or gossip your brother or sister. Because then at that point, you sinned against your brother or sister. Right? But maybe, maybe just say we're, we're, we, we have a pure heart. Maybe it's our spouse or maybe it's just a good friend, you know, whatever. And we're just like, you know what? I just need to get this off my chest. I'm not bad-mouthing this individual, you know, blah, 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 X, Y, and Z. The point is, that's not where it needs to stop. Right. Right. You need to go and have the conversation at some point yes. Yes. with the person that you've sinned against. Okay? Or the person that has sinned against you, sorry. The person that has sinned against you. You following? Go to them privately. And I will venture to say, when you start growing and maturing, at, at some point you need to stop having the sidebar conversations and start going to them one-on-one -on -one off the jump. Are y'all tracking? Because some of us, we need, we, need to be, we need to be honest about this. Because if you like me, some of us, we, we think we bad and, and we all bold when we're really not. <laughs> I ain't got no problem going to talk to nobody. If somebody sinned against me, they sinned against me. I'll tell them about it. Then, then the next thing when it happens, you don't go talk to them first. You end up talking to somebody else. And if we're honest, sometimes we talk to other people because we are hurt by what they've done. And so in some kind of twisted way in our minds, we're, we're trying to make ourselves feel better by putting that person down in, in the mind of another person. Can you believe it? I know, right? Just ungodly. She, how, she, he, he, she called herself a Christian. I know. You pray for, pray for us, though. Pray for me. I, pray for me. I need to. Why do all that? The Bible says just go to your brother or sister who sinned against you. Have enough love, respect for God, and for them to have the conversation with them. Step number two. It's still in the verse. Look at the verse with me. Well, well first, hold on, he's not finished with step one. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So if you confront them, you go, with, you go and have the conversation. You say, hey, man, hey, sis, you sinned against me. And they listen and they apologize, they confess, they repent, and they say, I'm sorry. Great. It's done and over with. But verse, my contacts. Verse 19. <laughs> ooh, Lord. Verse 16. Lou, Jesus, I, does that mean I need, ooh. Mm, mm, mm. 
It's time to change the prescriptions, Chris. But, <laughs> but if he or she does not listen, are you reading with me? The next step, step two, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So the Bible says once you talk step one, once you've done step one, and let's say they refuse, they, they, do, they don't respond positively, the next step, the, Bi the Bible, the Bible says. Yeah, yeah. Did you read it? Y'all still looking at me. Did you, the Bible says take one or two others with you to go have the conversation. Now, the Bible says they call them witnesses. Now, this, these are not witnesses of the sin that was initially committed right. by the offender. Because right. sometimes, most of the time, a sin that has occurred between two people is probably occurred in private or just between those two individuals. There probably wasn't anybody around. Maybe there were, maybe there were not. But the point is, the witnesses here are those who are brought into the issue by the offended party to investigate the following facts to confirm if they are true or have been done. Here's the fact number one. They, want, they need to investigate. You're calling two or three people to come in with you to investigate the fact of the offender's sin. Yes. Did you do what this believer said you did? It's to investigate it, to make sure that it is factual. The second fact that the, the witnesses are there for is um, to witness to the fact that there has been a one-on-one -on -one confrontation that has been initiated by the offended person. So in the conversation, y'all tracking, in the conversation, these two or three witnesses are basically saying, hey, did this situation happen this way? This person said that this happened, you know, is this, you know, what do you have to say to that? And it depends on the person, right? The person may be in denial. The person may be doing one of those things where they're saying, they're saying, well, no, that's just, that's just what he or she, you know, said or how they felt about the situation. But that whole thing is designed to help the, the witnesses to press down on the issues to determine if something really did take place or not, if a sin was committed, right? It's also their place as the two or three witnesses, again, to make sure that that person has had that one-on-one -on -one confrontation. Hey, sis, if you, did you have this conversation with them in private? Make sure that they didn't skip the step. Right, right, right. Okay? Here's the third fact. The third and final fact is the, they are, wanted, they are needy, needed to investigate the fact of the stubborn refusal or repentance by the offender. So they're there to, est to establish and investigate these things, establish these things, but they're also there that once they all, two or three of them, or two of them, or two others, yeah, one or two others with you, so two or three, that all three of you, all two of you can witness to the fact that we've brought the issue before this believer and this person refused to apologize. Now they are witnesses of that person's refusal in terms of step number two. Make sense? So you bring them in, two or three witnesses are there, they're there to investigate, but they're also there to call that believer to repentance, to call that believer to stop what they're doing, to call that believer to say, hey, you need to make this right. And let's say that that person refuses. They are now witnesses to that. Because then it goes to step three. Look at the verse. It says, if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, what's the next step? What's the next step? Is it in the Bible? Did you see it for yourself? Step one, one-on-one -on -one confrontation. However long that needs to take, by the way, notice there's no time frames to this. Step two is if, if that person refuses the one-on-one -on -one confrontation and doesn't confess and doesn't repent, doesn't stop the sin, then we're supposed to bring in two or three witnesses. The offended party is supposed to bring in two or three witnesses. 
And they are supposed to work with that individual, talk with that individual, try to get that individual, reason with that individual to get them to turn from their sin, to confess it to that, the person they sinned against. If they refuse that, the Bible says the third step is to tell it to the church. The family of God, the local church, needs to be informed so that they can attempt, we can attempt to intervene and call the unrepentant brother or sister to repentance. So then it's supposed to be brought to the church. Now, now some will say, well, this, this ecclesia, that, that means assembly. That doesn't necessarily mean the whole assembly. It can mean elders or X, Y, and Z. I, I, I think we're pressing too much. I think Jesus meant what he meant. You tell it to the church. Yeah. And you do it prudentially. That, that is, you don't do it on a Sunday morning when the, when the live stream is going. Right. Yes. This is a special called family meeting. Yes, sir. Put your phones down when you come to the meeting. Don't nobody be recording nothing. This is a family meeting that doesn't need to be aired out on YouTube. Yes. We need to come and talk about this. We need to bring that person before the church so that we can address that brother or sister in Christ and try to reason with them to, to turn, to apologize to this particular brother or sister that they have sinned against. Yes. The Bible says, if all that fails, I want you to see it. If all that fails, it's in verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, some have understood Jesus to be saying here in verse 17 that we need to just show somebody love and compassion. That's what Jesus did to the Gentiles and the tax collectors. But this interpretation or that interpretation, I believe, misses how Jesus is directing his church to respond to an unrepentant sinning brother or sister. This whole process was already an effort of compassion yes. and grace. Yes. The whole reaching out to them, the whole having the conversation with them on one on one and then and then two and three witnesses was the act of compassion and grace. So Jesus is not saying just continue. No, what he's saying is to a Jewish audience. Remember, these are Jewish disciples. Matthew's writing to Christian, a Christian Jewish audience. They understood exactly what Jesus was getting at when he said that the church needs to treat them as a, a, an unrepentant sinning brother, as a Gentile, a tax collector. They knew what he meant was this, that the church needs to distance themselves from him or her. Because that's what they did. That's what Jews did to Gentiles and tax collectors. We can't, we can't. And we can't do that with you. Because you're in unrepentant sin. One Risby writes concerning this issue. If by the time the matter comes to the whole church, the offender has not yet changed his or her mind and repented, then he or she must be disciplined. He cannot be treated or she cannot be treated as a spiritual brother or sister for it. He has forfeited that position. Yeah. He or she can only be treated as one outside the church, not hated, but not held in close fellowship. We don't hate them but we can't hold them in close fellowship. I think this is why we can't stomach some of this is because I don't think this has been taught enough. I don't think this has been preached enough. And especially, I don't think it's been practiced enough. We are called as a family when it is necessary. If somebody sins against you, if they, if they refuse step one and step two and step three, We've gone through all the means that we can and all the measures that God has told us to, and that person still refuses to do and to comply and to repent and to confess to the person they have sinned against. The Bible says, and at that point, distance needs to happen. And the church has to decide on what that actually looks like when it comes to this particular person. That is how we ought to confront one another when we unrepentantly sin against one another, when there is sin between us. Notice I said when unrepentantly sin. Yes. We all sin. Yes. We sin against each other. But, but there are those of us who are repentantly sinning. 
right? We, we know we sin. I shouldn't have lied. Sis, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have said that. I, I'm, my bad. That ain't who we're talking about. What we're talking about is somebody who is unrepentant. I know I sinned against them, but I don't care. Yes. Yes. Oh, you coming and you talking to me? You trying to come from me? What about you? You ain't, you ain't perfect. I'm repentant. I ain't confessing to you. Look, you know all the stuff you've done against me. You want me to uh, confess to you? I ain't, please. I'm repentant. But, but bro, sis, like that hurt me. Like you sinned against, you lied against, you gossiped about me, you slandered against. I don't, I mean, you, you telling me you ain't sinned against me? What happened 10 years ago or five, three weeks ago or five years ago or four years ago when you did that to me? How, not, man, whatever. You, I'm not, whatever. Just get over it. Like you, just get over it. I got over what you did to me. But that doesn't excuse what you did to them. That's unrepentance. I'm not confessing. I'm not owning up to nothing. I'm just folding my hands. I don't care. It's kind of nonchalant type of an attitude. The Bible says we have, there's a process that we need to handle that. One-on-one confrontation, two to three witnesses, bring it to the church. If that person refuses at that point, then we need to distance ourselves from them. And then there are times when there is unrepentant sin committed among us. So between us is somebody sins against you. That's Matthew chapter 18. But there are times, hear me, family, and I'm moving, hear me. There are times when there's unrepentant sin among us, meaning that we're not necessarily committing sin against one another, but we're committing unrepentant sin as, the, as a believer. See, some, some believers erroneously think or say that as long as I'm not sinning against another Christian, what I do in my personal life or outside the church is nobody's business. Wow. I'm a grown man. I'm a grown woman. Don't nobody tell me what I can or cannot do. God only, can, only God can judge me. You ain't my daddy. You ain't my mama. <laughs> you right on the last point. We are not each other's daddies or mothers, but we are brothers and sisters in Christ with the same heavenly father. Yes, and you're not right that God is the only one who can judge you. You are right that he's the only one that can eternally judge you, but you're not right that God is the only one who can tempor- temporally judge you judge you in this life in terms of call you to the carpet. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Our Heavenly Father has commanded us to not only pay attention to our own lives, but that of one another's as well. Oh, the Bible is teaching us today. I'll give it to you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. Here's what it says. I got this on the screen for you so you can see it. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Hear it, family. And it's on the the screen. If we love each other, we will look out for one another. Y'all, y'all remember this saying, good looking out? Anybody remember that saying? Good looking out. You know, we usually use that phrase when, when, when it comes to somebody letting us know, you know, they, that about, for example, an, about an item that went on sale. Good looking out. You know, you know Amazon dropped that down about 10%. Good looking out. Good looking out. Or we'll say, we'll say it when it comes to somebody informing us about an event or a concert that's coming to the city. As an example. Did you know such and such is coming? Cisco coming to DeSoto. What? Good looking out. Genuine. You know, ooh, whatever. You know, he back. Y'all better leave him alone. Look. What we say? Garth Brooks is coming, right? What? Because we didn't know something. We say, you know, some of us may not say that, but it's a colloquialism. Good looking out. Because somebody looked out for you enough, right, to, to tell you about it, to inform you about it. Good looking out. Or somebody's giving away free stuff. <laughs> Good looking out. Boy, what? I've been trying to get a PS5. They got some over here. Good looking out. What? Christmas is around the corner. <laughs> hey, man, them shoes that you said you like, they over there. 
they had you no know, such and such store. Good looking out, my boy. Yeah. Thank you. They got them Jordans. Good looking out. They got them Jordans. Who? It's over here. Off lead better. This store. Boom, boom. Woo! Good looking out. Thank you. We do it even, we do, we say this stuff, uh, uh, Darius, even in, in terms of mundane things where, you know, if, if our zipper brothers, is off, is, is, if our zipper train is off the track, oh, good looking out, bro. Good look, thank you. Good looking out. Or women, when you have lipstick on your teeth, good looking out, sis. Thank you. All right. Or when your collar's messed up, oh, sh- I was about to get up there in front of the church. But about to get in front of this meeting and my stuff out, Jack. Good looking out. We need to have that same energy. We need to have that same acceptance and appreciation for, look, for people looking out for our spiritual appearances. Sis, I'm concerned, man. You kind of been, you kind of been slipping a little bit, man. I heard you kind of like, like you've been on your social media wilding. You've been posting stuff like crazy. You know what we should say? Good looking out. Since I, you know, bro, like, like, man, I, you know, I ain't seen you, man. It's been a minute. It's like been about seven months since you've been to church. Good looking out. And I'm not saying that God wants us to walk around here policing one another. We need to be fault finders and looking for sin. But when we do become aware of unrepentant sin in each other's lives, unrepentant sin. Some of us, we, we want to jump on somebody at the, the moment we think they didn't step out of line and they didn't already confess to the Lord and everything and they, and they didn't try to make adjustments. The next time we see them at church, look, listen, I, I, you know, I'll be lurking on your social media and I didn't, you didn't did this for the last three months. But well, did you know I repented of that? I'm doing better than that. I didn't post as much as that, right? So we're not supposed to be those type of believers. But we're looking for sin. Not policing. Ain't nobody got a police badge, a moral police badge on. And, like, you know, God didn't deputize us to walk around and check on each other, you know, pull the glasses down or put the glasses up or get a high prescription contact lens. Contact lens. <laughs> but when we do become aware... God expects us to prayerfully, lovingly confront one another. So when unrepentant sin is committed amongst us, or among us, here's a couple of things. We restore one another. Here's what Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says. Some of you may remember this verse. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression or trespass, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of Humility or gentleness. When we, when we are aware that a brother or sister is unrepentantly in sin, our desire should be to restore that particular brother or sister. That should be our goal. And some translations say in the spirit of gentleness, but it really probably should say in a spirit of humility because it connects to the next phrase about keeping watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. We need to be careful. When we go to restore each other, we need to be prayed up. We need to be whatever because if we're not careful, we can be tempted by the very same thing that we're trying to pull them out of. So, but we're supposed to restore one another. Which means that we have to confront one another. About the sin. Here's another one. First Thessalonians chapter five, and we're almost done. First Thessalonians chapter five. We got one more section, and we're done. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse fourteen. First part of this verse says, "We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle." Another version may say. Admonish the disorderly. That word admonish means to warn somebody. Either to avoid a sinful course of action or to stop a sinful course of action. 
Family, did you hear what the Bible tells us to do? We are called to warn each other when we are in unrepentant sin. If I am in unrepentant sin, it is, it is, it is, it is a loving responsibility for you to come to me and say, Brother, Pastor Ed, Brother Ed, man, you got to stop. Yeah. Or don't go and do that. Well, I, I, I'm about to smoke me one tonight. I'm about to get lit high, about to feel good. Then I'm going to eat me a mango because they say mango is supposed to make you get high, even higher. Oh, I'll be watching TikTok. I'll be seeing what y'all be watching out there. Eh? Got to keep up with y'all. We got to know how to watch over your soul. Got to be aware. Somebody in this, in this church, if you love me, you need to come to me and say, bro, like, no. Y'all hear about these flings that happen, these affairs that happen with people? And people between Christians sometimes, and people say, I knew something was, it's not, something, something looks suspicious. Then a part of me wants to say, did you say something? Yeah. I'm not blaming you for the, but, but if you saw it, why didn't you say something? Yes, sir. I'm, not, I'm not saying it's on you if they continue to have this. I'm, I'm saying that, but man, as a brother and sister in Christ, we want to be, and I understand it gets a little wonky when you get beyond your local church and, you know, do, I don't really know them, X, Y, and Z. But man, at least amongst our local church, when we're doing life together, we should be able to say like, like, yo, no, <laughs> don't do that yes, or stop doing that, sis, because we are called to admonish, admonish one another. But you know, in the text, man, this is this is awesome. We know in the text, and this in relationship to context was was uh, specifically about people who you know who didn't want to work and different things of that nature. But again, it could be applied more than just people not working, right, for 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 their food and working for for and being busy doing what the Lord wants them to do. But notice at the end of verse fourteen, I love this. He says, "And we urge brothers and minus the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient." With them all. Yes. yes. Family. Yes, we ought to warn each other, but listen, we got to exercise patience. Because some of us, we, we ready out the rip. The first time we had that, you know, that one conversation, we read up, oh, pastor. Bring them, bring them to the church. Bring them, bring them to the church. Bring them out, bring them out, bring them out. Bring them out. That's this your first time. That, no. The Lord has been patient with you. Yeah. How long did the Lord deal with you with that sin? Yeah. Yeah. A year, two years, three years. So we need to be patient. As we warn, we need to be patient with them. We need to be patient with them. Some of us, we just, you know, and then some of us, we've got, the Lord has got, we've grown up. Lydia, the Lord, the Carl, the, we've grown up and we're not committing maybe that's those sins anymore. O't oh, we on our high horse, Jamil. We, <laughs> we like, what? You supposed to be slaying sin every day, all day. I ain't, ain't nothing, ain't no chains on me. Jackie, ain't no chains on me. I'm walking in my freedom in Christ. Yeah. Right? And praise God. But man, don't, don't, don't get beside yourself. Yeah. Like you've always been this way. Yeah. Like you've always been mature, always free from lust, always free from jealousy, always free from gossiping. You ain't always been that way. And just because you may not sin in the same fashion as another believer doesn't mean you have not sinned. And that doesn't mean that there are things that you have not struggled against to fight against and how you fallen over and over in that particular sin. <laughs> Well, they got drunk, they struggle with alcoholism. 
I never let a bottle come to my mouth. I've never been tipsy. I've never been intoxicated. I don't know how some Christians get, do all that. How can you smoke that stuff? That make your breast smell bad anyway. Like just, you know, mm, that's just, that's just, just make my skin crawl. That's self-righteous. We can say the same thing for you. Yo, gossip and self. Yo, self is self. Yo, you know, we can go that you coveting self. You know, you, you may not have sins of the flesh, but you got some sins of the heart. You know, the stuff that folk don't readily see. Jealousy and envy and, you know, malice and bitterness and all that stuff. That's just as ugly to God. Yes, sir. Okay. You in here, sir. So, so we need to be patient with one another. And then, and then next, y'all, y'all we, we don't like to hear this, but... We disfellowship from one another. Wow. Yeah, and that's, that's when you can hear, as my, my late father said, you can hear an uh, 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 ant piss on cotton. <laughs> y'all, my, my, come on, y'all, okay. I didn't mean, listen, my, fa- my late father was from Louisiana, and they just had sayings like that. So I didn't mean to be crash, but that's how he used to say it. You can hear, you can hear a, a mouse piss on cotton. Really, Daddy? Really? Get a mouse piss on cotton? <laughs> what does that sound like? Exactly. You don't hear it. Right? It's, just... <laughs> it's quiet. But it's in the Bible. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I got Jackie to laugh on that one, so I figured that I did good. The 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse 14. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him. Watch, watch the purpose that he may be ashamed. You know, I said this before and I'll say it again. I'm standing by it. There is such a thing as biblical shame. I know in our culture in the, nowadays that, you know, shame is not a good thing. No, you know, shame, shame at all. No, I mean, nobody should have any shame whatsoever. And I understand there is a healthy form of shame, right, where, where you're just self-loathing and you've, you've gotten over something, but there's the shame of that that continues. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who is in unrepentant sin and they feel no shame. There's a place where you should feel shame. Yes. It's called godly conviction. Yes. We're not talking about somebody who's repented and, who's, and the Lord has getting them over something and that's in their past or they're struggling against that. We're talking about somebody who is just brazen, heels dug in, I don't care, I don't feel no remorse about this whatsoever. There's a place for godly shame. And sometimes the way for them to feel that, Paul says, we need to disfellowship from them. We need to dissociate ourselves from them. But watch it. Watch, that's not all it is. Don't regard him as an enemy, though. But warn him as a brother. Hear this, family. Disciplining an unrepentant sinning brother or sister is never to be merely punitive, but redemptive. That's good, bro. That's good, bro. We're not just trying to disfellowship and excommunicate somebody from the church just because we want to punish them. The hope is that they will turn from the unrepentant sin that they are in. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, nothing can be more cruel. Hear it. Nothing can be more cruel than the leniency which abandons others to their sin. Nothing, conversely, can be more compassionate than the severe reprimand which calls another Christian in one's community back from the path of sin. Brothers and sisters, I need to say this as we move on to the, to the concluding part, the concluding section of this sermon. If you are ever on the receiving end of being corrected, rebuked, warned, or disciplined, hear me, brother. Don't, or sister, don't reject it. If you are ever on the receiving end of being corrected, rebuked, or warned, or disciplined, please don't dig your boots in. Please don't justify your sin. Please don't run away from the church. Please don't deflect it. 
Don't shift the blame because it's for your good. How many of us in here are parents and you realize when you discipline your child, what are you telling them? I'm disciplining you because I love you. The one who hates their child is the one who doesn't discipline them when they need it. And in, the, in, in, in an appropriate fashion. Hear me, family. Hate coddles you in your sin. Love confronts you in your sin. You want to see somebody that hates you is somebody who never confronts you about sin that you are committing. That person don't love you. They actually hate you. Because that sin is destroying your fellowship with God. The sin is destroying your fellowship with that, you know, with um, possible other believers. And that sin is making, wreaking havoc in your spiritual life. And they're just saying, keep at it. That's not love. That's hate. I need to say this to the ones of us who are doing the confronting. Remember that our goal is not to win the issue, but to win our brother or sister. We want to win them back, not to win the issue. The first issue that calls for us to confront one another is when there is unrepentant sin. The second issue that calls for us to confront one another is when there is relational conflict, when it's involved. Not every issue that surfaces among us as a church is sinful in nature. Y'all hear me? Not every issue that surfaces in the church is sinful in nature. Okay? Sometimes the issue has to do with disagreements or dislikes. Someone, un someone intentionally or unintentionally says or does something directly or indirectly to you that disturbs you. So, so how, how do you know if you need to address a conflict? Here are two possible indicators that you need to address a conflict with a brother or sister in Christ. Because, uh, you know, not everything needs to be confronted. Some things you just need to overlook. Like, you forgive, you just, you, you just, you just don't allow it yourself to be offended by it. But how do you know when something has, is rising to the level of where you need to have a conversation with a brother or sister? Here's, here's two ways. One is if you intentionally avoid them. Ooh, there's a lot of mouse and cotton flowing around. Y'all processing, I know. You processing. If you intentionally avoid them, it's probably indicated that you need, to, you need to address the issue. You come to church, and, and you ready to walk out, and you see that person standing at the door, and you take a beeline back over here, and you're just talking with somebody. You know you're ready to go, but you like, that person is still in the, in the doorway, and I don't even want to walk past them. If that's what's going on, it's probably an indication... It's time for you to have a conversation. If you pull up in the parking lot and you park next to that person's car, you see it and you back up and pull into another parking spot that's farther away, probably an indication that you need to have a conversation. If you sit down and that person sits next to you on the same row as you, and then you are start strategizing on how you're going to get up out of this row. You say, I'm gonna go, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell such and such to hold my bag or my purse or my Bible. I'm going to go to the restroom, and I'm going to wait till about 1045 because I know some other people are going to get here in church. And there's probably going to be more people on the row, and I hope somebody is on the outside because I was sitting on the inside, and that means that I don't want to cross over nobody, so I don't want to be a nuisance or a burden to anybody, so then I have a reason reason where I can just go and sit on in the back. So when I, and I know they probably going to feel a certain type of way about it. So when I, when, if, if they approach me, I got an alibi. If they approach me, then I'll say, you know what? I didn't sit there because uh, I didn't want to disturb, you know, people being in worship. And so I saw other people, y'all know how we get, we start strategizing and be like, yeah, nah. But we really know the reason why we didn't sit back there is because we have a problem with this individual. And then there's anger. If you see that person and anger wells up in you, when you see them or their name is mentioned, and you like, mm. <laughs> like you smile and then all of a sudden it's just like internally, maybe some of y'all don't make the facial expression, but internally you all twist it up. 
And now all of a sudden you just need to leave church all of a sudden? Like you just abruptly end the conversation with another person that you fine with? Like, you know what? I holla. I'm out. But you know what's going on internally? That's an indication that you need to, you need to address the issue. So here's the last two points. What happens when there's relational conflict? What are we supposed to do? This is in Philippians chapter 4. We need to discuss and resolve the issue. We need to discuss and resolve the issue. There's a small verse in verse 2 of chapter 4. It says, I entreat Udiah and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. These were two women in the church of Philippi. And Paul is appealing to them. And he's telling them, I urge you women, I plead with you women, you two sisters in the Lord, y'all need to agree in the Lord. You know what, we know what Paul was saying? He was basically implying whatever, whatever disagreement y'all got going on, whatever conflict is going on, y'all two need to hash it out. Y'all need to talk about it. Well, I'm just, I'm, I, I just, I, I ain't worried about it, Pastor. I'm, I'm good. Are you? What if she or she hugged, came up and hugged you? Were you hugging back? Yeah, I, I mean, Pastor, I ain't petty. I know how to chew gum and walk at the same time. I know I can, I can be cordial. But how, but how you doing in here, though? How you doing it with your attitude, though, related to that believer? We need, need to discuss it and resolve the issue. So my wife and I, there are times that we'll have a disagreement after 20 years, Jackie and uh, Chris, y'all understand, right? Carl Mika, y'all understand? All right, after 20 years, Lydia, all right, y'all understand? After 20 years, I say we've had our fair share of disagreements, right? I mean, y'all gonna leave me out here by myself? <laughs> Dennis, Nancy, right? Let me appeal to the senior, right? right? right. Had our share of disagreements and still do occasionally. We've gotten better. One of the things that I've learned to do with, 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 with us, we've learned to do is that when we talked about an issue, we, you know, we don't just say, are you good? We say, is, are we good? Because you can be good, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're good. And that's what we need to get to a point, family, where we discuss and resolve the issue at the end of it where we can say, are you good? Am I good? Are we good? Good. And then the last one is we need to solicit the help of a mediator. This is what he says in verse 3. I love this. He says, yes, I ask you also, true companion. We don't know who that is, but he says, true companion. What does he say? Verse 3. Help. Help these women. Who? What women? Udaya and Sympathy who are having a disagreement. I'm done. Close my Bible. Listen. There are some of us in here that we, we, I want to challenge us to, we need to really mature and understand that, listen, there are times that it is good to enlist a third party to help you in whatever relational conflict you may be having with a member of the church, or maybe it's in you on a Christian marriage, maybe it's with your spouse. I tell people all the time, man, listen, when it comes to the church and when it comes to my marriage, listen, I, we will enlist a mediator, a Christian mediator, somebody in, in that's a Christian to help us resolve our issues. Because right now, we ain't, able to, we ain't able to talk to each other without getting heated. Am I the only one? And Paul is saying, this third person, this third person, you need to help these women. And I want to encourage you. For some of y'all, this ain't even on my notes, but for some of y'all, as you're in a Christian marriage particularly, I want to apply it to you. Some of y'all been like, you've been trying. We can handle our issues on our own. Maybe you can, but there's some issues that you need help with. Yeah. You're right. You're right. And you need to come to this church body and, and appeal for somebody. It don't always, it can be a pastor. It don't have to be one of us. It can be a deacon, somebody that you trust who is mature. Anybody in the church can serve as a mediator, but you need to, you need to get a mediator to help, to help mediate that, that conversation that y'all need to have. And it doesn't just go for married folk. It goes for our church family as a whole. You have a relational conflict with another brother or sister in Christ, and you feel like, you know what? I don't know if I can have a conversation with this individual because I don't know if I'll handle it well. 
Can you help me? Then that, that, needs to be, that needs to be enlisted and solicited. And if somebody comes to you, family, that's coming with a third party, don't wild out. Don't spaz out. They don't be like, oh, you ain't doing this right. The Bible says that you're supposed to bring, you know, you're supposed to come to me one-on-one first. No, because they ain't sinned against you. Remember, we're not talking about sins. We're talking about just a conflict, a disagreement. In this case, they didn't have to follow Matthew chapter 18 because it's not a sin issue. It's just an issue that they have a disagreement with you about. Well, they got a dislike with, with something about you. Jesus said, the world will know that we are his disciples by how we love one another. This includes how we love one another when there is sin and conflict involved. May God help us to love one another well. Father, thank you so much for our time. We pray you will bless us as we prepare our hearts to worship you in giving. Uh, Lord, we want to pray for a person who may be here who needs to trust you, Jesus, as Savior. And Lord, we pray that you will help them to make that decision today. There may be a Christian here who needs to become a member of our local church or needs to be baptized. We pray, God, that you will help them to not put that off anymore, that they will be obedient to you and make that decision today. Lord, thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen.